Okay. I begin first in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. I thank God for the ability to come here, the ability to come together and congregate, to be able to uh, spend such time together when there are such tragedies across the world. I thank God that we're able to come together and speak about such a noble and important topic of Muslim leadership in the United States, which is not something that's new. Let me stress, it's not something that's new. Muslims have been here since the very beginning. It is a false idea to believe that this is a new subject or that Muslim leadership is something that is new to this country. And so when I speak about um, this topic, uh, first of all, I want you to realize that some of the themes which will be addressed in my topic will be echoed in other communities beyond uh, the Muslim American experience. So other people of other faiths, of other cultures as well, will be able to relate to some of the topics, some of the themes that we'll be addressing here. And then after I'm done with this uh, very brief talk, I would love to hear from you any sort of suggestions or comments or questions that you may have, whatever your background may be. Although to a certain extent, I'll be driving this almost specifically to the Muslims in the community, but everyone here who doesn't necessarily self-identify as a Muslim, I would love to hear also what you have to say, and I believe that you're also uh, able to learn something as well from this. So, as I begin um, this topic, it, which will be specifically on Islamic chaplaincy, which is an area of Islamic or Muslim leadership in America that I feel most comfortable speaking about because it is the one where in which that uh, I myself apply and the one that I've been studying for the past three years. And I've also chosen this topic of Muslim chaplaincy or Islamic chaplaincy because not that many people are aware of what a Muslim chaplain is within the American Muslim community and beyond. It's actually a rather new role within the American Muslim leadership and within the American society. Now, of course, what I'm going to say here tonight and also this position can also be applied to those of um, those within a Canadian background or those within the Canadian um, Muslim community and even Muslims in Europe as well. So let us begin. Now, for too long, the Muslim American community has been plagued with something that I call the super Muslim ideal. Okay, the super Muslim ideal. And this is believing that one single person can do everything that is needed in the community to make us a healthy and vibrant community. Now this Muslim, super Muslim ideal, which I'm calling it this, it has had some damaging effects upon the community. First of all, by raising the bar so high for any one individual to never meet. And also by making us so critical of anyone who steps forward to try to assist the community because although they're good in this aspect, they're bad in that that aspect. Because they're good here, they're not good there. Oh yeah, they're, they're doing great in the civil rights, but you know what, they don't uh, know that much about theology and so on and so forth. This is a plague. This is a paradigm shift, which before I get into the topic of Islamic chaplaincy, we need to address and we need to change. And I'm going to propose, before I talk about Islamic chaplaincy, a radical paradigm shift away from the super Muslim ideal. Now, this super Muslim ideal also has some effects that we see within our communities. Like, for example, when a mosque is looking for an imam to lead them, just listen to what people are saying his qualifications have to be. He's got to have memorized the Quran. He's got to have graduated from a uh, Muslim university. He's got to be a fluent speaker in Arabic, a fluent speaker in English. He's got to be good with kids. He's got to be good with adults. He's got to be good with the old. He's got to be young, but not too young, right? If he's good looking too, that's a plus, right? And so all of these, all these little things that people want from their imam that comes from this super Muslim ideal, because they expect one person to be able to take care of all of this, right? Now, in essence, <coughs> communities are looking for that super Muslim. And we need to change that. Another ill effect of this super Muslim ideal 
is that it excuses the American Muslim community from uh, the blame of not being where they want to be. Because the super Muslim is not here yet. No one good enough has stepped forward to make the changes that need to be done. So it's not our fault. No one good enough has taken charge. The super Muslim has not yet arrived. Yet nobody alone can actually tackle the numerous <coughs> challenges which the American Muslim community faces. Nobody alone is qualified or trained to be able to handle all of the diverse avenues that we as an American Muslim community need to tackle to be able to be a healthy and vibrant community. Now it's kind of interesting too when you think about it that we have this super Muslim ideal because every other aspect of our life is compartmentalized, right? Our government is broken up into departments. You know, you have education, energy, defense, you know, so on and so forth, agriculture. We have our um, health care system, which is broken up into pieces. You have children, adults, mental health, physical health, you know, uh, dentistry. You have optometry, right? Even at this school, you have, what is it, like eight different colleges. You have engineering, uh, management. Actually, uh, I checked out. You have here education, engineering, humanities and fine arts, natural sciences, nursing, public health, behavioral sciences, agriculture, and management. Was there anything that I missed? That's a bunch of different colleges, a bunch of different subjects. And I doubt that anyone here feels like they're proficient in every single one of them. Yet, when we walk off this campus, and we walk into the mosque, we expect our leaders to be proficient in everything. When we talk about the needs of the community, we talk about solving the problems by using the super Muslim ideal. Well, I have some sobering news for everyone here today. The super Muslim ideal paradigm is dead. The kryptonite reality. There's no super Muslim that's going to step forward to take care of the needs of the community. And we need to change this paradigm. We need to change this understanding and this way that we look at how to solve our problems in the community. <coughs> Rather than placing the responsibility in this idealized super Muslim, we need to place responsibility in the hands of the collective, talented community. Everybody has something that they can add to the community. Everybody has something that they can contribute. Whether you are a, you know, well-versed Muslim, whether you are just kind of on the brink, whether or not you are Christian, whether or not you are, you know, Baha'i, whether or not you are Jewish, Buddhist, atheist, whatever, everybody in the human community has something to contribute to society. Everybody. And so this paradigm shift, which I'm proposing, needs to happen now. It needs to happen now. So as I'm letting that sink in, I'm going to tra transition into one particular role. One particular role within the Islamic leadership, American Muslim leadership, that is most familiar to me. And one that is new and emerging and I think we'll be able to help respond to a lot of the issues which we as a community are facing today. And that is the Muslim chaplain. Now, most people don't actually know what a Muslim chaplain is. So let me give you a brief sort of definition. A Muslim chaplain provides religious and pastoral services within a secular setting. Meaning that well, let me, let me contrast it. Imams, for example, they're hired by a religious group, usually a mosque, and at that, usually the board members of that mosque. And they cater to a specific community who usually has like-minded ideas. But the Muslim chaplain, rather than being selected to necessarily guide like the whole community, they have a specific <coughs> service, which is to care for the pastoral needs of the community. In a sense, care for the well-being of the community. 
And this is often found within um, universities, which is more <coughs> so spreading, prisons, in the military, and also in hospitals that you see the chaplains being hired. And they are trained to care for people and their pastoral needs. And a sense of, again, someone's well-being. A Muslim chaplain is not there to necessarily tell people what is right or wrong about their belief system or the way they understand Islamic law. They're there to say, so your mom recently passed away. How does that make you feel? So you're having some problems at home. How does that make you feel? They're there to help touch on the emotional issues. In fact, that well-being. A person might know what's right or wrong. In fact, I'm going to mention a story a little bit about that. <coughs> but tackling <coughs> how to deal with that, how to interpret what's right and wrong into your life, that is where the Muslim chaplain can come in. Now, the certified chaplain is trained to provide this pastoral care. And they care for the well-being of the person. And let me give you just an example from real life, from my own experience, about how a Muslim chaplain can actually help the specific community, the Muslim community. While attending a mosque one evening, I was stopped by uh, a young Muslim man, about 19 or 20 years old. And he asked me, like often as a convert, you get this question all the time, you know, what brought you to Islam? But when he asked that question, I could tell in his eyes that it wasn't just the, you know, tell me like a nice uplifting story. He was desperately trying to understand something about Islam <coughs> that gave me the strength in his eyes to give up the type of lifestyle which I could have li lived if I wasn't Muslim. All right? He was looking for that type of strength, desperately trying to understand how it is that I was able to give up the type of pressures that he's facing in his community college. The same individual, let's just call him Ahmed, I spoke to him that night for about an hour. We're walking around the mosque that evening. And I was trying to give him the best advice that I had. And I, I found out while talking to him that he just was looking for someone to understand where he was coming from. He felt that were he to talk to the Imam, the Imam would just give him a legal verdict. Alcohol, haram. Dating, haram. As in prohibited. You can't do this. And so he actually came from a practicing Muslim family, but he was also scared to tell them about the peer pressure which he was facing at school. So he didn't know who to talk to. And this is an instance wherein, at that time, actually I wasn't an imam or I wasn't a Muslim chaplain, but at this time and in this instance you see where a Muslim chaplain can do some service in the community. They're there to address these issues. They're there to help people address um, these personal issues in their lives, how to reconcile what they believe with the context of the life that we all live. <coughs> so though I worried and prayed for Ahmed, and we, like I said, spoke for about an hour that night, afterwards I did not see him. And I asked about him. What, what happened to Ahmed? And I found out that his family had discovered that he was using alcohol and that he was dating women. And so they asked him to move out. And I never saw Ahmed again. So this situation illustrates the type of issues which our community is facing, which until, and I'm going to say that the Muslim chaplain can help respond to these issues, but most places don't have anyone to be able to take care and respond to these type of issues that, that people are facing. And in this case, the Muslim youth. Now, like Ahmed, most American youth are going through developmental changes, whether it be physical, psychological, social. And on top of these changes that they're going through, 
They're also facing the peer pressures of their parents to maintain cultural and religious customs. <coughs> On top of this, at school, particularly in the college context, you have friends who are pressuring them to adopt certain things which they know and they believe to be wrong. Like, for example, um, alcohol, premarital sex, dating, and so forth. But they don't know who to turn to. They don't know who to talk to. And they fear that were they to leave aside these practices, these peer, uh, what their friends are pressuring them to do, they would be ostracized by their friends because they're different. You know, because they have a different belief system. And then yet, if they accept that and they do these actions, just like in the case of Ahmed, they become ostracized by their family and the religious community. So where can such people turn? Where can such people turn? Now, while because of like a perceived lack of support that such people feel, like Ahmed and other Muslim youth, they don't know who to turn to. While imams at Islamic centers can and should play a crucial role in helping such people as Ahmed, they are not properly trained to actually handle this. In most cases, they are taught the ruling of alcohol, but not how to help someone facing peer pressure to consume it. Now, imams are often unfamiliar with the health services as well in the local community. So when someone approaches them, they don't even know where to direct the person to turn for help. Now, one study actually, uh, which was done in New York City, a survey of 22 different moths showed that not a single one of the imams, except for one, had any pastoral training. And of those, 91% felt that, uh, of 91% were educated overseas, or were born overseas and felt that language was a barrier between them and second generation Muslims. So again, we're having difficulty connecting with the Muslim youth. This lack of connection with the Muslim youth is even more disturbing when further studies show that it's not because that they're not attending the mosque that makes them estranged from the community. Because 41% of Muslim youth, in at least one study, attend mosque at least once a week which is 14% higher than the average worship service of people in their age group. So Muslims are attending mosques. So they actually believe, the same study shows, that at the same time while attending mosques so often and in such large numbers, that they're least likely to believe that their community is improving. That's disturbing. And it tells us something very important that they believe that the right services are not being provided by their Islamic centers. Now, Imams can play a crucial role if they have the right training. However, American Muslims pre presently lack any sufficient educational institution to actually train Imams to really address the present day context. For example, most schools that teach you the uh, traditional Islamic studies, right, like for example the Tajweed and the Islamic law and theology and so forth, they don't actually teach you pastoral care. And at the same time, many institutions that teach you pastoral care don't teach you <coughs> the traditional Islamic sciences. So most of the times, an imam, if he d has studied at a school, we have a lot of imams who are actually self-studied, but if they have studied at a school, they haven't even covered this type of material in their curriculum. And so, when mosques are looking for an imam to hire, the pastoral care and whether or not they have this education is not even something that is on their list most times. It's not even something that they're looking for. So, due to this, you have imams who are um, varying in uh, degrees of education. You could have some who have come back from overseas after graduating, you know, maybe from a very prestigious Islamic university overseas. But when they come here, they don't yet understand the context. They've been away for four, eight years, 
and they don't understand, they don't have the tools, more importantly, to address these